happy Easter. Such a good day. Uh, wanna, if you got your Bibles today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Open your Bibles there and just park there for a few minutes. We'll get there eventually, I promise. But my question for you today is, have you ever had a moment when you're just like, man, I was way off. Have you ever had that? Has that ever happened to you where you were just like, man, I was way off. Off. If I want to start an argument with me and Liz, when I, she asked me for directions, what I'll do is instead of saying, you know, hey, go down to Power and Germain and take a, a right, I won't say that. What I'll say is, go down to Power and Germain and turn north. And she's like, what do you mean north? Uh, uh, that's the question I want to ask you today. Are you a turn north person or are you a turn right person? Wh which one of you guys? Some of you guys are saying I'm, I'm a turn right. Some of you guys are saying I'm a turn north. I'm a turn north kind of guy, like north, south, east, west. I know where I'm going all the time. I at least I try to, right? At least I try to. Liz wants to know, do I turn left or do I turn right? That's all she wants to know. A couple, mo or a couple months ago, I was visiting the city of San Antonio for the first time. And usually what I do when I get into a city for the first time is I'm driving in. So I try to orient myself where everything's going. And I, I want to know what's north and what's south. I just want to know what direction I'm heading. It just makes me feel better about life. It makes me feel more comfortable. It makes me feel settled. And I just know what's happening if I know where everything is going. But this time I wasn't driving. I was driving with someone else. And they just took me straight to my hotel from the airport. And I, I, I was looking at my maps and I saw that the Alamo, this famous, you know, thing in San Antonio was like just a couple blocks away from my hotel. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to go down and see the Alamo. The problem was I didn't know what direction I was heading. I didn't know what was north, what was south, what was ever. And so I was like, OK, I, the, it's just a couple blocks east. I'm just going to go out of my hotel and I'm just going to start walking east and we're just going to get there. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to take some photos. I'm going to send it to my wife. It's going to be awesome. So I go out of my hotel and I just start walking. And I'm like, well, I feel like I should have gotten there by now. I look down at my phone and I was going the wrong direction the whole time, like the complete opposite way. And so I like doubled the trip. It was just it was just really bad. And so I, some sometimes we just go through life and and we feel like we're confident. We feel like we've got it. And we're but we're just really wandering around. You ever felt like that sometimes? You just didn't know which way you were going. You had this moment where you're just like, man, I was way off here. We're trying to figure it out on our own, but some of us get completely lost and we can't tell up from down. And this is the story that we find ourselves in in Acts chapter 17, this group of people who were trying their best to find the direction in life, purpose in life, a reason for living, what God was doing. And they were trying all kind of things. What happened was, is this group of people, this is when Paul was in the city of Athens. And in the city of Athens, they had this hill that was called the Areopagus. And what was on the top of this hill was they had all these statues surrounding this hill to all these different gods. And some people would say, well, this is the one that we should go to. Some people would say, no, this is the one that we should go to. Someone would say, well, this is the one that's going to solve all our problems. And others would say, no, this is the one. And there were so many around this hill. And what would happen is, is they were like, well, we're just going to try everything. And then finally, one day, they kind of got together and they said, well, guys, we might have missed one. So in case we missed one, we're just going to come up with this statue and we're going to call it to the unknown God. And there's a statue there at this hill to the unknown God. And so Paul was, walked in and he saw this. He saw these people who were wandering all different directions, just trying to figure out which way they should go. And in Acts chapter 17, let's drop into the story at verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens... His spirit was provoked within and he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the market every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, I'll tell you what those guys are in a moment, also conversed with him. Those two groups, the Epicureans and the Stoics, those were on two different ends of the philosophical spectrum. Two different sides of, of ways of thinking about life, of ways of directions that we should be living. But both of them kind of taught the same thing, that your works, your virtue, your, the best that you could live by living your best life, you could achieve where, where you needed to get to go. If you could only work hard enough, 
you could be right with God and the universe. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like that? Like, man, if I could only just get my stuff together, if I could only just like string a couple of wins together, if I could only just string a couple of days together where I didn't sin, if I didn't do that sin, if I didn't do those things, if I could just string a couple of wins together, then everything would be right with the world. And those people thought like that. They thought, man, it, like we just ha- if we just work hard enough, if I do the right things, if I act the right way, if I do all this stuff, then I will be right with God. And we still see this in religion today. We still see it in religion today. Some religions like Eastern religions teach that enlightenment can be achieved through suffering. So as you go through things, you're going to get closer to where you need to be with the universe and with God. Others teach that God has grace for you. This is what the LDS teaches. God has grace for you, but only after you do all the work. So God will cover everything else only after you do your work. And so there's this idea that we've got to work towards my virtue will earn me the place that I need to be with God in the universe. But these both these ideas that these these people held, they're contradictory to what the Bible teaches. In Ephesians chapter uh, two, verse eight and nine, Paul says this. He says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of work so that no man can boast. God does it. It's not about what you've done. It's about what God did for you. It's about the work that Jesus did on the cross. We talk about Jesus on the cross. We just uh, uh, took communion together. Jesus' body that was broken. Jesus' blood that was poured out. That was the work that needed to happen to make you and I right with God. That was it. That was it. And so we see this idea. And and, and so back to the story in Acts 17, when Paul's talking to these two groups who think that they've got to earn it, they've got to work towards it. The first group that we read about was the Epicureans. Epicureans, they were pleasure seekers. They're, they're, they're a little different from, from hedonism, which that just means like they just chase after every desire. So whatever you want to do, just do it. But they taught that ultimate pleasure was the absence of pain and fear. They were, were against superstition and they sought out ways uh, to take away the fears of death in the divine. Their whole idea was like this, you, you do you. I was watching a game the other day. There was a casino commercial and the, their whole thing was you do you. That was the philosophy of these people. Like just, just go ahead and try to get as much pleasure as you can get. And we have a world around us that they they think like that. Do you guys know people that think like that? Man, if I could only get the right house, the right car, the right job, the right, all this stuff. And if I could just get all this stuff and I get the, you know, the, the, the perfect vacation at Disney and I get the season tickets and I get all this. And if I get, 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 get. And if I do all the right things, if I get the pleasure, then I'm going to feel fulfilled. But what, what we know is that you don't get fulfilled that way. That was the Epicureans. The second group was the Stoics. The Stoics felt like that, that, that if they developed enough self-control, enough fortitude, and if they could overcome their own emotions, they would do this by like burying uh, life that it, as it came to them and burying emotions. They would just put it inside and just kind of take it in, take it in, take it in. And, and if they did this, then this, this would improve their ethics and their moral well-being. Their idea where if the Epicureans were like, you do you, their idea was, it is what it is. It is what it is. Do you know anybody like that? It is what it is. It doesn't matter what's happening. It just is what it is. And so Paul, he, he's walking up and he sees these two people. He sees these two groups. And one of these groups are saying, hey, you do you, whatever you want to do, whatever pleasure you want, just go ahead and go after it. And this other group that says, you know, life is what it is. And there's going to be sin. There's going to be destruction. There's going to be things in the world. But just, you know, take it all in and just handle it yourself. And don't don't. It's just on you to deal with it. That's the two groups that Paul was talking to. Chasing happiness or people who had just given up hope. And so he says this, some Epicureans philosophers, this is verse 18, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And they said, what is this babbler? He's talking about Paul. What does this babbler wish to say? Other says, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, of, 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 of gods that we don't know about. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. The idea that people would not only follow, but base their entire belief system and hopes on an executed criminal to these Greeks was absurd. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, it talks about this. For some Jews demand signs. If Jesus was the Messiah, if he was the chosen one, if he was the one that was going to come and overthrow Rome and set his people free and do all these things, revealing the power of God to set people free. For Jews demand signs. That's what they wanted from their Messiah. The Greeks demanded wisdom. They sought wisdom. If Jesus was the Messiah, he should have known that when he was what he was coming into and in wisdom, he he should have navigated the situation better to where he wouldn't have gotten crucified. That's what the, the when Paul talks about this, but he says, but we preach Christ crucified. This is a stumbling block to the Jews and it's folly to the Gentiles. Why is it a stumbling block to the Jews? Because if the Messiah was going to come and overthrow Rome, Rome would not have crucified him. They wouldn't have happened. And, and if it's folly to the Gentiles, then Jesus in his divine wisdom and everything that he knew about, he would have navigated the interactions with Rome better and he wouldn't end up crucified. This is the, what Paul is teaching. But to those, he continues, to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So he holds the power of God and he holds the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Back to Paul in Athens. The, the philosophers conversed with him and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was teaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the area of This is this hill where all these gods are saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting for you bring some strange things to our ears. You're talking about stuff that we haven't heard before that we don't recognize. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live Live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. How many of you guys know that we live in a world that's like that too? I just want something new. I just want something new. Here's the thing about new stuff, right? The newest Christian book, the newest teaching, the newest whatever. As, as your pastor, this is what I want for you. Do what God has told you to do. Don't worry about the next new thing. Don't worry about, you know, oh, well, this is the new thing that we got to do or this is the new. No, no, no. If God has told you to do like some basic stuff in the Bible, love your neighbor, pray for your, love your enemy, pray for people, take care of the poor, take care of the orphan, take care of the widow. Like just, just love people that's around you. Don't worry about the new stuff. Just focus on the old stuff. Do the old stuff well. Do the old stuff right. And if we do the old stuff well and right, then guess what? Anything new that comes along that God has for us, you're going to walk right into it. You're going to be there when it's there. Just be obedient to where God was. The, the, we talk about the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. God doesn't show you the journey. Sometimes he just shows you the next step. And if you're obedient to that step, he's going to show you the next one. Do the old things well. And so these people were always wanting to look for something new. What's, what's new? What's the new thing? What's the new word? What's the new word? And, 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 and some of us are still like that today. That does not mean that God is not still speaking to us. He does speak to us. He does guide us. He does direct us. The Holy Spirit walks with us and teaches us new things every day. I hope he does that to you. But don't always feel like it's got to be new. Be obedient to what God has told you to do before. They would spend their time always looking on something, something new. Some of us are waiting on God to tell us to do something when he's already told us to do something and we didn't do it. Some of us are waiting on God to tell us to do something when he's already told us to do something and we didn't do it. Be obedient. Love your neighbor. Care for the sick. Honor your parents. Sacrificially love your spouse. Uh, you don't need a new message, a new word all the time. Quit doing nothing and start doing something. The power of the cross that Paul was talking about to these men, the power of the cross that he was sharing, was love in action. The power of the cross is love in action. How do we know this? The most common verse in the Bible, you can probably quote it. If not, it's simple. I can quote it to you. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave, gave unto death. Jesus died. He gave his son all the way that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal 
life. Jesus laid down his life so that we could be forgiven and made right with God. When you see the cross as a Christian, as a believer, you don't see folly. You don't see a stumbling block. What you see is the power of God's love in action for you. That's what it is. The power of the cross is God's love in action. Jesus laid down his life so we can be forgiven and made right with God. The power of the resurrection. This is what's cool about Easter. At Easter, we look at the cross. I was in a church a couple, couple years ago, and they did a, they did a song, uh, and it was a popular song. I think it was on the radio, I, it, like big Christian radio song. It's like, the cross has the final word. That was the name of the song. Here's the thing. The cross didn't have the final word. You know what had the final word? The resurrection had the final word. Jesus rose from the dead. And so there wasn't this thing where, 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 where the cross was, was it, and where death and, and, and hell had the last word, where the, the torture and the destruction of everything that, that, that went through, that Jesus went through, beat him. No, the resurrection overcame death in the grave. Through the resurrection, Jesus defeated death. He defeated the cross. The power of the resurrection breaks the power of death. The power of the resurrection breaks the power of death. The resurrection shows us that our faults, all of our shame, all of our doubt, all of our fears, our sickness, our pain, all of these things, everything that's rolled up into death has been defeated by the power of Jesus. And so if you're in here today and you're in a situation, you feel like, man, there's no way out. There's no way that I can get beyond this. There's no way. There's this struggle that I keep dealing with, that I keep walking through. There's this sin that seems like it's attached to me and there's no way I can kick it. Whatever it is that's in you right now where you're like, man, I don't know how I can get through it. Jesus defeated even death. He defeated even death. The one thing for all of humanity, for all of history that humans have been afraid of, that we don't know the answer to, that we've been chasing the fountain of youth, that we've been chasing a way to to, to heal our bodies and do all these things, that we've been trying to beat death forever because it had the final word. Jesus defeated it. So there is nothing in your life that has the final word over you. Jesus has the final word. The resurrection has the final word. And so the power of the resurrection breaks the power of death. And this is the message that Paul brought to the Athenians. This is the message Paul brought to these men. Romans 8 verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. C.S. Lewis, yeah, the the Chronicles of Narnia guy, that guy, he wrote some other cool Christian things, by the way. Um, he, He said this about Christianity. He said, Christianity, if false, so everything we believe about about God and about Jesus, if that's false, it's of no importance. But if it's true, it's of infinite importance. Christianity is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. That's the only thing it can't be. So if you're in here today and you're like, man, I don't know if I believe all this. I don't know. I mean, like you're talking about Jesus and he he defeated death and he rose again and he he did all this stuff. Listen, if it's not true, then it's it's not important. But if it is true, If we can get victory over sin, if we can have life, if we can have resurrection, if he is alive, then it's of infinite importance. It's of infinite importance. All of us must go about living life where the gospel isn't just a piece of who we are, but it's all of who we are. It's all or nothing. And so the question today that's been asked of us And the question that that was asked of of Paul, the question that was asked of the disciples, the question that was asked of these Athenian men that were on that hill that day, is once you hear what Jesus has done for you, once you hear of the the, the death that he, he, he died on the cross, once you hear of this blood being poured out of you, his body being broken for you, once you hear of this, and then you hear that he rose again, once you hear this, the question is, is who do you say now that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he Lord? Is he, is he the one who was crucified and, and, and raised from the dead? Or is he just some guy that was a good teacher that, that, that people are like, oh yeah, well, some people believe in him, some people don't, okay, whatever. 
Or does it matter? To us as believers, it matters. To us as believers, this is the hope that we stand on. This is the life that we have. This is like the hope of our eternity that we put our trust, our faith, our life. We put it in the fact that Jesus rose again. And because Jesus rose again, everything changed. So what did Paul say to those men on the hill? This is what he said in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. It's a great, like, bridge builder statement. I perceive that you are very religious. (laughs) For as I passed along, I observed the objects of your worship. I also found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man nor is served by human hands as if he needs anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man the very, every nation of man to live on the face of the earth having determined the allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places that they should seek God and that perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not actually far from each of us. Paul's message was that God who had been unknown can be known. He wants to be known. And he closes with this. There are times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. What does that mean? That means to turn away from your sin, to turn away from your pride, to turn away from your selfishness, to turn away from you living life your own way, to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. That is Jesus. And of this, he has given the assurance to all by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. On Friday, Jesus was crucified with thieves. On Sunday, he rose a conquering king. Paul calls us to repent. He calls us to turn. I'm not going to continue the direction I was going and the lifestyle that I was living and thinking that I was right all the time. I'm going to continue. I'm not going to continue making my own opinions, my own beliefs, doing what I think is right, me doing me, or just uh, saying it is what it is, making that the pinnacle of my existence. No, repentance means that it's all about Jesus. Paul uses another word in his letter uh, to the church in Rome, and he says this, that we got to confess. What does confess mean? This simply means that we have to say the same thing that God says, to conform our words to him. That's what that means, confess. And so in, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it's just the simplest way that we become a Christian, the simplest way that we give our lives to Jesus. It says this, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that means we say the same thing that God says about Jesus. If we confess that Jesus is Lord, what does Lord mean? That means I'm not on the throne of my life anymore. Jesus is on the throne of my life. What he says goes. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God did what? raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and be saved. So today we are grateful for the resurrection. We celebrate it because it is our hope. The resurrection is our hope. That's what we put our hope in. That's what we believe in. That's what we put, it's what we confess is what we, what gives us the power to overcome sin. Colossians verse uh, 1 verse 26 through 27 says this. The mystery hidden from the ages and generations, but is now revealed to the saints. To them, God chose to make him known. Great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope 
of glory. When Jesus comes inside of you, when, when the, you accept the work that he did on the cross, you now have the hope of glory. You now are no longer in the pit of despair, in the pit of sin, in the pit of shame, in the pit of anguish, in the pit of, of, of your own grief and your own uh, um, just guilt. You, you don't have that anymore. Now we have the hope of glory. And this comes through when we repent and when we confess. No longer our way, but his way. When, when we're, we're not waiting on something new, we're doing what he's already asked us to do.